how to create a covering letter that, that is read. Um, my background is um, recruitment, and um, I have worked for um, several recruitment companies. Um, and the last recruitment company I worked for was Norman Broadbent, and I recruited up to director level. Um, but I, I've I've done pretty much every level of recruitment um, in virtually every different um, sector as well over the years. So I've recruited in finance, in uh, technology, uh, FMCG, retail. Um, so lots of different areas. And so I've seen a lot of covering letters. Um, I saw a lot as well after I finished with my kind of headhunting career. I moved in-house um, to PwC to recruit um, in the consultancy area where I've recruited um, for people with a couple of years experience right up to partners. So quite a, a different range of um, people with different levels of experience. And um, again, I would see a lot of covering letters. Um, in 1999, I set up a company called WorkMaze, and um, I moved into being a career coach. Um, I sold my controlling interest in that company uh, this summer and set up Career Farm, which essentially is a career coaching uh, company. And over the years, um, I've helped people, a lot of people, with their covering letters and, and CVs. And um, tonight, I want to share with you some key things to consider when you're putting together a covering letter. Um, and I suppose there's, there are a few books on covering letters, and there's one that, that I think is pretty good. Um, it, it's difficult because it's, it's tailored to you. So these are general points, um, some of which you may have seen before, but it's worth remembering them, especially if you haven't written a covering letter for a while. Um, so that's kind of my background. Um, and there's just a few of you today, um, so this session probably won't run for the, the, for the whole time. Um, depends how many questions you have. Um, but um, I'm hoping this will be useful for other OU alumni who can come back and, and look at this when they're in a position where they need to write a covering letter. So um, um, we're going to look at a structure. Um, I'm always a bit nervous about giving a template for a covering letter, but it's what people generally want. Um, it, interestingly, I was speaking to somebody yesterday who's a career manager at the Judge Business School in Cambridge, and then she said, you know, we really hate giving out templates because every every let, covering letter that goes out from this business school is the kind of judge template, and recruiters know that. So I think, you know, do be careful with templates. Yes, I'm going to share with you a very basic one. Um, the book I'm going to share with you has loads of different covering letter templates in it, and and, that, and that's quite useful. Although obviously that people have a lot of different experience and they're approaching different types of companies, but I think it'll help you get a, an idea of what's required. Um, so it's a little bit like um, CVs as well. Having a, a template for a cover, for a, for a CV, you really need to make it yours. Um, but there are some kind of very uh, basic things that come out both in my experience and also in, in the book that I've kind of picked out as one that's, that's pretty good. Um, so we're going to look at um, an example of a covering letter that's worked and talk to you, I want to talk to you about why it's worked and what I see good covering letters um, cover and um, some mistakes perhaps to avoid. Um, and how to make yourself stand out. And some of these are quite simple, but I see an awful lot of covering letters and many people don't follow these rules. And it could be because they don't do what I do every day, which is look through loads of covering letters. So, um, you know, so although, although these points are often obvious, people, the majority of people don't follow them and therefore they don't stand out in a good way um, with a busy recruiter. So I just wanted to ask you, um, have you been in a position where you've had to read covering letters as part of the hiring process? Because I, I think this is often really, um, it's useful if you have, because you, you know what it's like to be a hiring manager. You're very busy, you don't have a lot of time, and you have all these covering letters and CVs to look through. Um, so I just wanted to know whether any of you have. So if you could um, hit the yes or no button. Okay, so Robert has. Great. Good, good. So 
Robert, if you want to jump in and uh, share any of your experiences as you go through, because I think, uh, you know, it's just as valid if you've been a, a recruiter, you know, you know what you were looking for. Um, so it, I think it's useful to try and think about that when, when you're um, writing covering letters yourself. But it's always harder when it, you're doing it for yourself. I know when I've had to write a CV, I've found it really difficult, although I find it really easy to look at other people's CVs and give them advice uh, on their CVs. So it is about trying to stand out in a competitive marketplace um, in a good way. Um, a lot of covering letters don't get read particularly carefully because um, a CV, a, a, unless a covering letter is doing its job, it will often get overlooked and you'll go straight to the to the um, CV. Um, I know myself that, uh, you know, I will look at covering letters and unless they're giving me exactly what I want, then I won't probably even read them. I'll go straight to the to the CV and see whether they've got the experience that I want. But if a covering letter is good, it can really help you get in the interview pile and really make you stand out as a candidate who becomes top of, of the shortlist pile. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit um, about kind of email covering letters because you know I'm I'm ancient I'm 41 and I've been doing it a long time and and really I've seen it's definitely in the last couple of years that you know a lot of um, applications are now via email and so I want to talk a little bit about that um, <laughs> being is smiling um, I want to talk about how that's changed the game slightly. I mean, there's still a lot of the rules apply, but it has changed it. You know, you used to be printing your CV, CV and covering letter out on beautiful white uh, paper um, with a good weight to it and sending it in off in a lovely envelope, but no longer. So it is, it is a challenge to try and um, make yourself stand out. And interestingly, I was helping somebody last week with their covering letter. You know, and this is a guy who's a finance director of a big telecoms company. And he was writing a covering letter to his dream employer. Um, so he wants to make a speculative um, application to a renewable energy company that he's targeted as somebody he really wants to work for. So um, you get different types of covering letter, um, but this one was really to kind of open up the opportunity to speak to them possibly about whether there might be an opportunity in the future there. And one thing that struck me about the covering letter he wrote was that there was no real reference to him doing any research on that company. And this um, client of mine is not particularly in a rush um, to move, so he could spend some time doing some research on this company and perhaps even speaking to somebody within that company to give a little bit of insight as to what they might be looking for. I think this goes a long way to making you stand out in your covering letter, um, especially when you're trying to make a speculative approach to a company that you really want to work for, like, like this client of mine. Um, so he's gone away now to do a bit of research. And with things like LinkedIn, it's you know you can do a search on LinkedIn um, on companies to find out if anybody in your network knows somebody in that company. And then you can ask for introductions to that person. And LinkedIn has a massive um, reach. And I was reading a book recently that said that you know we all have about 250 contacts. Um, and if you don't have 250 contacts as a business person, you're not trying hard enough. Um, <laughs> and um, and what well, you know, I'm a massive fan of LinkedIn because I, I think it's it's a way to keep up with your contacts and it's a way to then um, use them to get introduced to people you you want to meet in a targeted way. So there's you know, I mean, he may not be able to find somebody within this company, but I'd be very surprised because it's a quite local to him. He's based in the southwest and it's local to him um, and he's he's he has quite a few contacts through the business school um, and obviously a lot of people in that business school are based in the southwest as well um, that he goes to so you know again so he's trying to find something to really as a little bit of a hook really in the first bit of his his introduction covering letter um, and it could be something like I've noted, I've read in the paper, or I've read in your press release on your website that you're expanding into Spain, or you're looking at this new product area, or um, I've recently seen about this or that. And just to start to show that you've done a bit of research, um, I was doing some recruitment for a company called Michelle a couple of years ago, 
and the client was just so annoyed that none none of the candidates seemed to have done any research at all on the company and this was you know was a kind of mid level executive level it was kind of a senior business analyst um who would be working between the business and IT and really at that level they had hoped that they would do some research on the company so pretty basic but you know it doesn't seem to be done okay so we're going to look at an example, but I just want to give you a structure on the content. So the opening paragraph needs to explain what you're applying for and why you've applied. And if you're making a speculative application, um, you know, like the client I was talking to you about, it needs to be you know, why you have an interest. Perhaps pick out something that, that you've read about them in the press or, or something of interest. It could be also that you know somebody in the company and you've spoken to them about it. I think particularly when you're trying to make a speculative application to a company, you know, it can really help if you know someone within the company and they've they've suggest they've they're okay with you using their name. Um I think I've covered this in previous webinars, but obviously in the, in the kind of well any economic climate actually and a direct approach and networking, a lot more jobs are are found by that certainly I find that with my clients. Um, a lot of companies these days are pleased to get direct applications from applicants because they can potentially save a lot of money by not using recruitment companies. Um, a lot of my clients have been successful really targeting applications to hiring managers, not, not necessarily HR managers, but hiring managers um, and building relationships so that when there is an opportunity, they'll be, they'll be called. So the opening paragraph, explain what you're applying for and why have you applied. Then a background paragraph, kind of summarize a few key points about yourself in, in, in a paragraph and your experience. Then moving on to the selling paragraph, emphasize your key transferable skills and experience and maybe link to the role in the company. I'm going to show you a way to do that. I find bullet points as a recruiter really easy to read. It, it breaks it up. My worst nightmare is having two pages of very heavy text big chunky long paragraphs are just kind of just saying oh no <laughs> so i'm going to show you an example of a covering letter uh, where it just makes it so easy for a recruiter and that's what you want to do is make a recruiter's life easy i think also people sometimes forget that the person reading the covering letter might not necessarily have a background in what you're doing so the first person screening your covering letter might be somebody in HR, it might be an administrative assistant, so it might not be do somebody doing the job you do, or somebody who doesn't really know your industry that well, or the company you've worked for. So although sometimes you might feel I'm spelling this out a bit, that's okay, because it might not be somebody with a particular background in, in what you do who might read your covering letter first. Then a closing paragraph to kind of confirm your interest and, and the next steps. And sometimes I see covering letters which are like begging, begging sentences, like please, you know, please call me if there's any interest. You know, yes, I'm, sh you know, you you want this contact, you want this job, but also there's kind of uh, you don't want to come across too desperate. Um, so it's kind of getting a balance of being eager but not too too keen. Um, you know, I've I've seen the. You know, if you if you have a moment, please call me. I've genuinely sort of seen things like that on covering letters. <laughs> I should keep them actually. Um, so yeah, so just be be aware of that as well. Just one thing on covering letters to headhunters. Um, on the closing paragraph, I would I would suggest you put um, your location preference um, because you know if you're if you're and if, and if you're looking for a certain uh, range of salary. Um, I mean, it can it obviously depends on your own individual circumstances, but you you will get asked that by a recruiter. Um, you know, if you're sending sending your a covering letter and CV to a headhunter, then it really cuts down the amount of time they have to call you to find out this information. You know, I only really want to work, you know, 20 miles from York or whatever, um, commut commutable distance from you know, Leeds or Maidenhead or whatever it is, make sure you put that information to help the headhunter know what kind of companies you're you're looking for as well. So, you know, you might say, I don't want to work for arms companies or, or whatever it is. It just helps the recruiter uh, work, work better with you. Okay, so let's have a look at um, 
the sample uh, covering letter. This document is on our website, and I'll give you the login details for that a bit later on. Um, there's information here about oh, um, about CVs, but I'm not going to go over that today. But you might find that interesting. So um, you, I think on your on your screen, you may need to scroll down yourself. Um, I, I I think when I sc scroll down, you won't be able to scroll down. So um, this is a, was a covering letter that wasn't actually that bad. This was quite good, but we changed it um, to a new covering letter, which was better. Um, it was a better summary of himself. And if you can see here what, what um, this candidate has done, he's basically linked the experience that they're looking for with what he's got to offer. Okay, um, So like bullet points, like a mirror. Um, and this is just great for a recruiter because what, what recruiters do is they have a list of criteria that they need to be screening against. And then if the candidate has done like this person has done, has made like just brought out how they meet the basic criteria, then really they should make the interview pile or the shortlist pile. Um, I don't know if um, I don't know if any of you. Um, sorry, I was just reading. Uh, I hope Robert, you can scroll down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it. Okay. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. I got distracted by a question. Um, so, yeah, so basically this, this mirror technique, um, even if sometimes you feel like you're repeating a bit of what's on your CV, then that's not, not a problem. Um, what, what you're aiming to do here is get to the interview stage. And I remember what I was going to say. I don't know if you're familiar with how headhunters work, but essentially when they've got a job, they will get all the CVs and covering letters in. Um, normally, rough as a rough average, if they place an ad, they, they'll probably wait two weeks to get everybody in before they start to decide who to um, bring in for interview. And what they tend to do is then take a long list to the client, go through that with the client. I mean, it varies with clients, but this is generally what happens. And then with the client, discuss each long list candidate and then bring that down to a short list, uh, kind of a shorter list and they might interview, I don't know, for one position they might interview four, five, six candidates. It really depends how many people have applied and what the quality is. And then produce a short list of two to three, normally three candidates to, to present to the client with a full interview notes. And then the client hopefully would take all of those three and then interview them. So, um, so it's very important that you that you do this mirroring. If you don't meet all the all of the criteria, then what I would do is just bullet point the criteria you do meet, but not actually spell it out because otherwise there's going to be a big gap where you don't meet that criteria. And interestingly, I I don't remember where I read this, but apparently um, it's true that um, women tend not to apply for things unless they meet all the criteria. Uh, whereas men, um, you know, will put in an application if they maybe meet kind of 70, 80 percent. So just, you know, you never really know who's going to be applying. And plus the fact you never know whether a company, you know, if you're not right for that position, they might be recruiting several positions. Um, you know, I've had that happen when I've been recruiting for a client and I've got a, some, a CV that's come in that's either too senior or too junior, but I've still shown the client and the client's been interested in interviewing them for another role. And it's great for the recruiter because they make, you know, more commission if they can put somebody else in as well. I've had that happen where somebody applied who was a bit too senior, so they came in to interview, but they still went through to the client with the proviso with they're a bit too senior and actually it was a, a new department and the and the organization was growing and so they hired, the, hired them anyway um, so you never know um, yeah so basically that's I don't know why the bottoms uh, cut off that hmm. anyway um, so how you would finish with that Um, is um, they 
obviously if you've been asked to put your salary, you need to put that. One way, sometimes I have um, clients who feel that their salary is quite low and that they don't want to, to, to state it, is that they you can put a package, you know, if you put all the bits together. Um, it, it's a tricky one. I think it's one um, where, you know, as a recruiter, I will want to know what your what your salary is and I will want a breakdown and I will ask you that and I will ask you all the little bits you know what's your pension what's your car allowance that kind of thing um, I have had somebody recently in a workshop who said well I was asked that and I said I'm, I'm not going to tell you um, it's not relevant <laughs> and I was really shocked but he apparently got away with it because he then got offered the job later down the, the track but I I don't know. I think you have to be careful. From my point of view, I I would say to a client, you know, tell them, but say that you know I'm I'm looking for the market rate. I'm actively interviewing with other companies and make sure that they that you are as well. It is a little bit of a game, the whole recruitment thing. Um, I remember when I used to interview at PwC, I'd say to people, you know, who else are you interviewing with? And if they said some of the my competitors then I would fast track them. I'd say to the partner, you need to get this person in really quickly because they're interfering with some of our competitors. Um, I'm not necessarily saying lie because I, I think you can tell when people are lying, but um, it's important that you you have activity so that you feel, um, you feel um, confident um, that you've got other things going on. Okay. So, um, so that's an example of a successful covering letter. I'm going to go back to the uh, slides. No, that's not it. I seem to have lost it. I don't know why. Ah, oh, there. Good. Okay. Um, um, there are a few books on the market, and there's... Well, the book that I've written, uh, which is, um, if not now, when, how to take charge of your career, we've got a section on covering letters, but it's not very long. Um, so, um, and there's another book by a guy called Simon Howard on kind of CV and covering letters. And again, it's not very long and it's pretty basic. And I think, um, you know, I've covered most of what you'd need to know, really. Um, maybe the other thing would be, you know, if there's a job spec, what I would do is get a pen out and circle all the things that they're looking for and then link that into your covering letter. Make sure that you've, you have answered all the questions in the job spec, you know, when they say we're looking for these, these criteria. One thing I just want to say about covering letters is to try and keep it as evidence-based as possible, you know, down to your experience. I think one of the hardest things to do is to try and give evidence of competencies so soft skills like communication leadership it's easier to give examples of evidence of your experience i have five years experience of market automation email experience it's much easier to do that whereas i've seen covering letters that have tried to explain that they have a competency in leadership and they often end up being pretty woolly really and kind of opinion based so people say i am a fantastic leader and really that's just their opinion so just be careful of that unless you've got something very concrete to, to back it up so let's say presentation skills you you might want to say something like i ha regularly present to the board or i regularly present business cases to the board which are then um then um then the board decides on on on, on the information that i i present so something like that would make me think, mm, they're probably a pretty good presenter if he regularly presents to the board. Um, but just be careful of competencies. Really, competencies are tested at interview by companies. Um, so at PwC, we would have a list of competencies like communication, leadership, entrepreneurial ability. Um, and we would ask questions at interview. Give me an example of when you've led a team through um, a difficult um organizational change or, or something like that so as you can see really at interview that's what we're trying to do really at the covering letter and cv stage we're just trying to work out whether you've got the experience to, to make it to interview and i do see people get make that mistake and it all ends up being a bit woolly and confused so i would if my advice would be to keep it very evidence-based but sometimes in a job spec you don't have a lot to go on um, so you 
you know, so you may want to pick up one or one or two things where you've got a clear example, clear evidence of a competency. So um, one of the books that I I have, um, which is called Ultimate Covering Letters by Martin Yates, it is slightly American. Um, well, it is American. He is an American. Um, and it's quite a big book, and um, and it's got 4,000 successful covering letters in, which is quite good. But it's it's very broad. You know, there are people applying to teaching jobs, to um, but also business roles. So it's and people have lots of different experience. So it's difficult to kind of uh, to pick out any one. Um, but I think what Martin did was go. Th- go to lots of headhunters and a lot of recruiters, a lot of corporate recruiters, and get about 4,000 successful covering letters. And he kind of worked out from that, why were these being successful? And I was pleased to read that quite a lot of them concur with my opinion. So the first thing is that really it should be one page if it's a a covering letter. Um, I totally agree with that. Um, The first two sentences should state the purpose. Um, It's got to hook you in. Um, within the first two sentences and, and not be too too woolly. Um, they suggest copying, well, he suggests copying the text of your CV into the body of your email after your name. And I, in, interestingly, somebody sent me a CV this week that I had real problems opening because they, they'd done it on a Mac. Um, and even though I've got a Mac, I just couldn't open it. And I think it was the way that they'd saved it. Anyway, with lots of toing and froing, eventually he sent me a CV in a format that I could read. But he was a career coaching client. But had he been somebody applying to a job, you know, would the recruiter have bothered to email him back? So I think that's very good advice to paste your CV in underneath your name. Um, most covering letters are now email. Um, so it's important to keep that brief and to make sure it's in a one-page view. Um, I just want to show you just, this is from his book, um, an electronic search letter for a job opening. And as you can see, it's pretty brief and to the point, but it picks out what, how she meets the criteria. Um, um, and it's, you could read that in, a, in one page view. So don't try and do too much is, is the key really there. So hopefully you can read that by scrolling down. Okay. Um, they also suggest using the subject line to highlight your match with the role. Now, this is where it's a little bit American, this book, because it says, you know, new HR manager, or I am your new HR manager, which I don't agree with, and it's too pushy, certainly for the European market. But what you can do is obviously put the reference and the fact it's a, an a application for, let's say, HR manager. Um I still would attach your CV because the formatting will be better in an in an attached document. I actually think PDFs are quite good because it, you know, you don't have any formatting issues really with a PDF. Um, the only proviso to that is is if you're sending it to a headhunter, you might want to put that as a as a word document as well because often headhunters will take off your contact details before they send it to their clients. But if you're applying to a company, then I would definitely um, say save it as a PDF and save it as your name as well, Um, your name and maybe the date. A lot of people save it as strange things, Um, but yeah, make sure you save it as your name. And make sure you, on your sign-off, put your mobile number and your email. Ideally, it shouldn't be your work email. Uh, You need to set up a new like Hotmail account or Yahoo account for job hunting purposes if you're in a job and you're searching for a job. It looks pretty bad if you're using your your work email. Plus the fact work has every right to have a look at your emails and see that you're applying for other jobs, which is probably not a good thing. So while I wouldn't say it's the best book in the world, um, it does have some useful points and I quite like the the templates that it has. Um, I think one of the hardest things people find is to write that hook, uh, that try and find that little bit of information to to make them them stand out. so it has some quite good resources about that. Okay, so um, yeah, so the soft copies that I've shown you tonight are on the Career Farm 
website. I meant to say, please ask questions as we go along. <laughs> um, but now we can ask. You can your um, ask questions. So that's kind of a quick overview, really, of of covering letters. Um, does anyone have any questions? Silence. <laughs> Little brains are whirring around. I might just have some questions. Yeah, I can um, put my email as well on here. Uh, oh, I don't know if I can actually. Fiona, would you mind just putting my email on 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 the? I don't know if you can do that. Put my email um, on there because people might have a question afterwards. I'm more than happy to answer. So you there's only do. six six attendees, so I'm happy to answer any questions after the event. Okay. Would you mind putting my email on there? No, that's fine. Don't For some reason, I can't do that. Uh, I've just set up chat, so I'll just um, send that out. Everybody just bears me a second. Okay, cool. So you can access through our website, and I think I can show you this, through our website by logging in. No, I've forgotten the login. A, is it O U? Ooh. Fiona, do you remember the login? <laughs> uh, um, let me just quickly have a look. I think it's would have been good. Oops. O U B S. That. Okay, hopefully everybody can actually see your email address yeah, now. Yeah, it's just popped up. So you can log in through our website to um, get some resources relating to that. So um, actually, we'll we'll put up the we can put up the electronic one, can't we, Fiona? We can. Yeah, yeah. I'll put so that up tomorrow. Brilliant. That's go up tomorrow. And the CV and covering letters relating to the workshop is that document with the CVs. I've put a couple of CVs on there that have worked and. Um, ones that didn't work and then ones that did work, um, but w that's really relating to another um, webinar. Um, so that's that's the main one. So um, that's there if you want to have a look at that that example, the sample one. Okay. Okay. So um, I don't think we have any questions. So please do. Moment. Do email me if you have any questions on covering letters. You might want to mull over what I've said, um, and um, I can post get I can send the answers to the LinkedIn group as well. Um, so um, I, I won't obviously say who's asked the question, but I can post the answer on, on the LinkedIn group, and I'll also send you a copy if you want to drop me a line after the event. Um, and we have some forthcoming webinars. Um, so Sandy is a Google uh, recruiter and Microsoft recruiter, and she's going to do um, a, a webinar on MBA and leadership hiring. She recruits executives for those companies, so that should be an interesting session on the kind of inside track on what those kind of companies are looking for. Um, and then I'm going to interview two OU alumni. Um, I don't know if you guys, do any of you put your hand up if you know any of these two, Jamie Campbell and uh, Keith Grinstead. Um, which will be really interesting about how they've grown their companies and the work that they do. Um, and then in December, I'm going to be doing one on one of my favourite um, personality questionnaires, uh, which is Myers-Briggs MBTI, which um, I'm running some workshops at Bath University on uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And it's a tool that um, I really like. It's really useful for team dynamics. It's also useful for career work, but particularly team dynamics. Um, so that's that's in December. Then January we we are having um, Jessica Price Jones of a, uh, an HR consultancy called Eye Opener um, do a session on happiness at work, um, and she she lectures regularly at um, various different business schools. Um, so it's great that she's going to do a session. She, she's a judge, I think, uh, next week, and. Um, 
at Oxford as well. She she speaks out. So it's great. She's going to come and do a, a session uh, for OU on happiness at work. Then we've got one on managing conflict at work. I should be listening to that very carefully. <laughs> um, Dave Barrett, no relation. Um, but um, no, I think that'll be really interesting. Dave does a lot of work on kind of conflict management and dealing with difficult people. Um, so really interesting. Um, so I'll know how to manage you, Fiona, after that. No, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll know how to manage me. I think quite More well. importantly. <laughs> um, <That's> so, <laughs> true. so, um, so that'll be good. And then in in March, um, Natalia Coleman, who's just fantastic. Um, she's an image coach, and um, she works with a lot of kind of senior people to improve their image at work and. Although sometimes you think, oh, that sounds maybe image is a bit fluffy, but actually it really makes a difference, especially as you become more senior as how you're perceived. And, uh, you know, we'd all like to think that it's nothing to do with how we, um, what clothes we wear and how we present ourselves, but it it has everything to do with that. Um, so that will be a great session, and I think it will lend itself very well to webinars because she's going to have lots of images, and uh, so that'll be good. So... Thank you very much. If we don't have any other questions, um, I will leave you to email me if you do come up with any questions. Um, it's been it's quite a difficult subject to make exciting covering letters, um, but hopefully I've given you an overview and some samples um, so that you can go away and craft your own covering letters. Um, so, so thank you, Fiona, for um, for um, hosting. No Tonight. problem, it's a pleasure, and thank you everybody for attending. Yep. Um, I hope you found it really useful. And there will be um, a copy of the recording for those of you that did join late. I know a couple of you have only really just joined. Um, it will be available probably by the end of the week. It will be on the um, Open University website, so I'm sure they'll actually publish the link at that point, um, and you can catch up on anything that you've obviously missed out on. And as Jane said, obviously if you want to email Jane, uh, with any questions that you have that you maybe think of either tonight or tomorrow, then that would be great. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Yeah, thank you very much. Good right, evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night.